Now, I'm going to talk about pharmacological tests of Horner syndrome. To understand the pharmacological tests, we need to understand the anatomy as well as the neurotransmitter involved in the sympathetic plexus. First of all, let us just look at the picture over the lower part. The central and the preganglionic neuron will secrete the acetylcholine over the synapse, whereas the postganglionic neuron will secrete the noadrenaline to the receptor of smooth muscles and the glands. So to confirm the diagnosis of Horner syndrome, we can use a cocaine 10%. The mechanism of the cocaine is block the uptake of the no adrenaline. So in the intact sympathetic plexus in which the no adrenaline is being released and binds to this receptor of smooth muscle and glands, if you use a cocaine to reduce the block the uptake, so there will be persistently stimulation of the smooth muscle and the glands. So if we instill a cocaine 10% in the normal eyes, after one hour, the normal response will be pupil dilatation because of the cocaine effect. However, if we instill a cocaine 10% in the patient with Horner syndrome, the ipsilateral sites affected by the Horner syndromes, the pupil will remain constricted because there were no, no adrenaline released by the postganglionic neuron. Contrastly, in the other eye, the contralateral eye will have a normal dilatation after the installation of the cocaine eye drops because of the mechanism of cocaine that I mentioned before. Hence, this pharmacological test will result in increase in anisocoria in the Horner syndrome because the pupil over the affected size will remain constricted, whereas the normal pupil over the contralateral size will further dilate because of the cocaine effect. Beside cocaine, we can use apraclonidine 1% to help us diagnose Horner syndrome. Apraclonidine is a weak alpha-1 agonist. So after installation of apraclonidine 1% in both eyes of the patient suspected to have a Horner syndrome, the normal eye will not dilate, but the ipsilateral affected side of the Horner syndrome will dilate because of the mechanism of the apraconidine. We know that in the Horner syndrome, there will, there will not be a release of no adrenaline towards the receptor of the smooth muscle and the glands. Hence, this smooth muscles and the glands receptor will have a denervation hypersensitivity so when we drop a uh, aplaconidine, which is a weak alpha-1 agonist, the affected eye will have dilatation because of the denervation hypersensitivity. So after installation of one hour, after uh, one drop of aplaconidine 1%, there will be a reversal of anisocoria, in which the site with the Horner syndrome will further dilate because of the denervation hypersensitivity, whereas the normal eye will not dilate because we are using a very weak alpha-1 agonist. After we have confirmed the diagnosis of Horner syndrome, we can use another pharmacological test to identify the level. We can only differentiate the postganglionic from the central and preganglionic neuron lesion. So the hydroxyamphetamine 1% has a mechanism to increase the no adrenaline release from an intact postganglionic neuron. So if the patients with a postganglionic neuron lesion, they will not have a release of no adrenaline despite the installation of hydroxyamphetamine. 
Whereas, if the lesion is higher up in the central or the preglandulate neuron, because of the intact postglandulate neuron, the no adrenaline will be released, which is stimulated by the hydroxyl amphetamine one percent. So, we usually instill one drop of hydroxyl amphetamine one percent in both of the eye and wait for one hour. After one hour, if the small pupil further dilates and the anisocoria disappear, so it is a central preglionic Horner syndrome. However, in the postglionic Horner syndrome, the small pupil will not dilate. Hence, the anisocoria will be persistent after the installation of hydroxyamphetamine. After we have examined the patients, and we do some pharmacological tests, we should proceed with investigation related to the lesions which we suspect to cause a Horner syndrome. If the lesions is over the brainstem or spinal cord, we can order a MRI of the brain or a spinal cord. If a patient we suspect to have a pain cause tumor, we can first do a chest x-ray to see whether there's any lung lesion, especially over the apical region. And then we can further order a CT thorax to confirm our diagnosis. If patients have any mass over the neck region, we can order a CT or a MRI of the head and neck to identify how big is the lesions and what is the lesions. As I mentioned previously, if a patient presented with a sudden onset painful Horner syndrome, we should suspect a internal carotid artery dissection. We can perform a carotid Doppler or we can order a MRI or a CT angiography to help us with the diagnosis because these patients might need an urgent anticoagulant because this is a very life-threatening condition. If the lesions is over the cavernous sinus or in the orbit, we can order a CT or MRI of the head and orbit to identify the location and further manage accordingly. In a nutshell, to diagnose a Horner syndrome, clinical history is very important. We need to ask patient whether patient have any recent trauma or any surgery, especially over the neck region. We also need to ask the onset of the Horner syndrome. Clinical examinations can be assisted by the pharmacological testing, which will help us to confirm our diagnosis as well as to determine the level of the Horner syndrome. Further investigation can be carried out based on the clinical findings. And then we can manage the underlying causes. I hope my presentation helps the understanding of Horner syndromes among all the trainees. Thank you.